So just wanted to share a little bit of information about the Community Cats podcast. We've released over 300 episodes. Um, we cover all topics that you can think about for cats. We also run many educational events, including Fundraising Day, which is on October 17th. And we also have the online cat conference, which is uh, January 29th through 31. And that's an oh my gosh, 2021. We have the online kitten conference coming up in June. Um, we also have the Community Cats Grants Program, which is a program that provides matching grant funding to help support spay and neuter services for small grassroots organizations. Um, and so far that program has assisted over 100 groups. Um, if you're thinking about any holiday shopping, uh, the Community Cats Podcast website has a newly released swag shop. So feel free to go there and check it out at communitycatspodcast.com. So pretty much anything and everything that you might want to know about the Community Cats Podcast is over there at our website, communitycatspodcast.com. Certainly like to thank uh, our technical cat, Kristen Petrie, for helping make <laughs> these webinars happen. Um, I'm so thrilled. I'm so thrilled for everybody who's tuning in for today's web webinar. I want to thank everybody personally for all the things that you do for cats, for caring for the cats, for loving those cats, uh, trapping those cats, getting them spayed and neutered, making sure that they're fed and making sure that they're cared for. So I want to thank everybody for taking the time to attend today. And I'm really excited for our upcoming webinar with Brian. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Brian. Brian is the Brian Cordes is the co-founder and national programs director for Neighborhood Cats, which is a leading community cat advocacy group with hands-on programs in New York City, New Jersey, and Maui. Great combination. Currently, he and his wife Susan Richmond live in Hawaii and usually can usually be found trapping cats or releasing them after they've been neutered. In in between stints with Neighborhood Cats. He served as grants manager for PetSmart Charities, overseeing over $21 million in TNR and spay and neuter projects. He's produced many of the leading educational materials on trap neuter return, including award-winning books and videos, and he's assisted numerous communities in setting up large-scale TNR programs and is a frequent presenter on community cat issues. Brian has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Cornell University and a JD from the University of California at Berkeley, and I believe uh, he is uh, Return to Field Handbook just recently got an award, a Muse Award from the Cat Writers Association. I believe I saw that recently. So congratulations on that. Uh, Susie Richmond is the Executive Director of Neighborhood Cats and she joined the organization after over 20 years running a major New York City shelter and nonprofit veterinary clinic. At Neighborhood Cats, she has led multiple large targeted TNR projects in New York City and Northern New Jersey and managed a uh, program for providing scholarships to veterinarians for training in high volume spay and neuter of community cats and co-authored the Humane Society of the United States online course in T on TNR. In her spare time, she can often be found trapping feral cats on Maui. Um, and so Susie will be out there in the Q&A world. And so you'll, you'll hear, I'm sure, bits and pieces from her out there. Tomahawk Traps uh, is our sponsor for today's event. A big shout out and thank you for Tomahawk Traps. They also have a code, a discount code through the end of the year, which is DCNC20, and you'll get 10% off any order um, through Tomahawk Traps. And um, Tomahawk's mission is to inspire or exceed our customers' expectations by providing them with the highest quality humane animal control products available. Our friendly, knowledgeable professional staff will help inspire and educate and problem solve for our customers so they can effectively use our products. Um, and Brian will be referring to Tomahawk Traps probably uh, several times throughout this presentation, but they've been tremendous supporters of this webinar series. And so I'd like to make sure we get a strong shout out to them and, and thank you for all their support. Thank you ahead of time. For those of you who did send questions ahead of time, I have pre-captured those questions. And then at this point in time, uh, Kristen, any more technical reminders before we hand that microphone over to Brian? Uh, nope, but people would love if you would repeat the code for Tomahawk Traps. It's DCNC20, capital DCNC20. Um, and we'll put that in the chat. Kristen, you want to throw that in the chat? All right, excellent. Don't forget to get those handouts, folks. And um, Brian, the mic is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Stacey. Um, and just to add on to one thing that you mentioned, um, our, our own Susie Richmond here has also got a Muse medallion from the Cat Writers Association for 
the Return to Field Handbook, um, which people can find at animalsheltering.org. It's published by the Humane Society of the United States. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, one of the things Stacy mentioned was downloading the handouts. And definitely you want to hand that, uh, you want to download the one that says uh, Colony Caretaking Tips and Tricks, the PDF file. That's all the slides that you're going to see today. So um, you don't have to sit there trying to madly uh, write down all the links and um, tips and things like that. Just download the slides and it's all there. Also, we're going to take a break in the middle of this presentation. And um, you'll have a few minutes to you know, go use the restroom or, or grab a snack for a second. And then we're gonna do a little bit of cat trivia. So we'll, we'll, that'll be about halfway through. And I think to start off, we um, do our favorite thing here with uh, Community Cats Podcast, and that's um, a couple of polls. Do you wanna take those over, Stacy? So where are you located? Are you in Eastern United States? Central or Midwest United States, Western, Canada, or outside the U.S. and Canada. And so those Easterners, they've shown up today. So we've got Eastern United States, 57%, uh, Central or Midwest, 19%, Western, 18%, 1% from Canada, welcome, and 5% from outside the United States and Canada. Well, that's great. Well, we have a, a diverse audience, and um, thank you all you Easterners, too. So uh, let's see. I think we have one more before we get going. Great. How many outdoor cats are you caring for in total? None at this time. One to five, six to 10, 11 to 20, and more than 20. So we have 13%, none at this time, 30%, one through five. Uh, 20%, 6 through 10, uh, 11 through 20, 16%, and more than 20, 20%. So it's pretty even distribution. Wow. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of really dedicated people out there. So thank you. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully we'll, we'll get something for you today uh, that you can use uh, in your daily caretaking. So uh, uh, Stacy introduced us. So um, won't belabor this, but this is Susie and myself and uh, four of our non-foster failures, which is makes this a very rare photo. And also want to let you everybody know that in addition to um, this webinar, uh, we've done past webinars that are available at communitycatspodcast.com. Uh, and there's the link. One's on trapper uh, tips and tricks. And the other one is on how to use the drop trap. So for that aspect of uh, TNR, the trapping and the drop trapping, um, be sure to check out those webinars. And I will also want to mention that uh, our next event with Community Cats podcast is going to be our TNR certification workshop. And uh, that's basically an introduction to all aspects uh, of TNR in terms of trapping and caretaking and um, all the different things that are part of this we go over. And at the end of it, you receive a certification that you you attended and um, there's a, a pretty easy quiz if you're watching the whole thing that shows that you know you, you attended and uh, gathered, you know, learned what we're uh, teaching. So um, check that out. That's coming up on October 3rd and the link to register there is on the bottom. So let's get into the topic of the day, but, and, and I promise these won't be throughout, but we do love our polls here. So we have one more poll um, before we talk about the bond between cats and caretakers. Do your colony cats have names? And we have, of course they do. No, names aren't important, caring for them is. So, 87% say that their colony cats have names, and then 13% say no, um, but caring for them is important. Okay, great. Well, I think that that shows how personal it can get, and that um, a lot of uh, colony caretakers, in fact, almost all, treat their uh, colony cats just like they would their pets, or have the same um, bond. And 
when we talk about caretaking and and cat, colony cats, especially if they're um, feral at all, the bond really centers around food, and that's what this slide is about. It's it's the act of feeding these guys and and the way they um, uh, become dependent and and they rely on you to be there for them and to provide their sustenance that really forms uh, that very, very strong bond between the cats and their caretaker. And, and they're not, all people are not treated the same by these guys. Um, they know who is their caretaker and they respond um, specifically to them uh, in terms of closeness and trust and um, all the things that go into that kind of, of a relationship. So we're gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about food and feeding and how to go about that. So the first thing we want to talk about when it comes to feeding is having a feeding pattern. And this is about uh, when to feed. And keep in mind that cats are very habitual creatures. Uh, if you have pet cats at home and they like to eat early in the morning, then you know you're not going to be sleeping late until you, you have to get up and take care of them and then maybe you can go back to bed. But uh, they they have internal clocks that are um, incredibly precise. So we, as caretakers, we can take advantage of that by getting them on a routine that's as close as possible to the same time, same place daily. So some people can feed at 9 a.m. every morning. Uh, some people, it's got to be a little more of a window, like maybe uh, late afternoon, most days. But whatever you can do. and uh, you can uh, click or train them. So uh, when you're getting them on this routine, and, and the way you get them on the routine is just to start it. If you start putting the food out at a certain time every day, they will pretty quickly learn and become habituated to that. And uh, if you uh, create a unique sound, that will also help them with the routine. And uh, they're very sensitive to sound, so they may uh, learn the sound of the engine of your car, for example. Uh, but you can help them by uh, jingling your keys or using a certain kind of whistle or um, getting an actual clicker and make that unique sound every time just as you're coming to feed. And if possible, choose a time that's uh, quieter, uh, that's less trafficked. And we'll talk about this. You also have to consider wildlife and bugs and trapping plans about when, and, and of course your availability uh, when you decide when to do this. And the reason for this is uh, not just because they like it, but it will make it much easier for you as a caretaker to monitor the cats if you know when they're all gonna show up. So if you're there at dusk every day uh, and all of a sudden there's a new cat, you're going to see him right away, not uh, have a bunch of kittens and then wonder where they came from. Also, when it comes to trapping, it's really uh, in, essential, really, to know when the cats are coming. So you're not hanging out there all day hoping they show up, but you know they're going to be there at 9, so you're there with your traps at 8.30 setting up. And um, it also makes it possible to get them to be hungry. So the day before the trapping, you can withhold the food or greatly cut it down so that when you're trapping the next day, you know when that they're going to be there at the right time and you know that they're going to go into the traps because they're going to be hungry. So having this feeding pattern is um, as much of one that you can create is really going to greatly uh, make caretaking and the whole TNR process much easier. So now let's talk about uh, what you feed. And the number one thing you want to think about here is reading the ingredients label. Um, and so what you want to do is uh, look at the back of the can, right? And uh, look at that in, at the bottom there, you can see the ingredients. And basically they're listed in the order of volume. So on this, this is a pet guard uh, canned food. And you can see, the first ingredients are all uh, meat-based, uh, beef, beef broth, chicken liver, kidney. And that's um, as opposed to uh, um, 
a much less expensive brand, which might be, um, or lower quality, which might have corn or, or maybe meat byproducts, not whole meat, but um, something like that as, as the uh, first ingredient. So that's your first clue about the different qualities. And um, so remember that cats are um, obligate carnivores. So uh, the more meat and protein that there is in the food, uh, the more nutritious it's going to be. But we do have to keep in mind that um, better is pricier. So it, it, it's not necessarily what you're gonna end up choosing. This is more just so you know uh, what your what choices you're making, but not you know very few colony caretakers are going to be able to um, f feed their their cats uh, canned pet guard because it's like three or four dollars a can. Um, on the other hand, if you're taking care of one or two cats, then maybe you, you'll make a decision. I'm sorry, a decision to go ahead and pay for that. So this is we'll talk about how do you balance you know your needs and and the cat's needs. Um, right now we're just trying to identify uh, what the food is and what's in it. If you want to learn more about nutrition, there's a whole field out there about it. Um, we recommend The Natural Cat by Anitra Frazier, who's um, actually one of our board members. And this book came out several years ago, but it, she was really uh, one of the, the first, if not the first, writer to um, approach cat nutrition in a natural way. And so there's just a wealth of knowledge in her book. And here's a few websites as well that you can go to to get real up-to-date information about feline nutrition. So when we talk about what kind, another thing that comes up often is um, wet food versus dry food. And again, we're not making judgments now on what you should buy. We're just trying to educate you on knowing what you're buying. So I think the easiest way to understand the difference between wet food and, and dry food is this picture, which is, um, now I'm a vegan, so I don't eat meat anymore, but I used to. And um, I think I would much rather eat the, the photo uh, on the left than the photo on the right. So the photo on the left is a, uh, would be the equivalent of wet meat. Um, whereas on the right, that it's been baked to a crisp. So if you were out going out to dinner, which would you order? And obviously the, the wet meat is going to be more nutritious because it's not baked to a crisp. It hasn't had vitamins destroyed. It hasn't had a lot of its nutrition taken away in the baking process. So if you're looking at the exact same brand, so if you're looking at pet guard canned food versus pet guard dry food, the wet food is going to be inherently more nutritious. Now, it gets trickier when you're talking about, well, what about Frisky's wet food, which isn't as high a quality canned food as Pet Guard, but Frisky's wet food versus Pet Guard dry food. And that's where it gets kind of tricky and you, you really need to, um, you know, read up about it. But basically quality is, you know, quality is quality. But it, within a brand, the comparison is, is pretty simple. So now let's talk about value, like I mentioned. And the saying we have at Neighborhood Cats that, that we found is a really good guide is choose the best quality and type of food that you can comfortably afford. So, you know, if you can, if you've got a small colony of cats and um, it's not a big deal to you to buy a high quality canned food and feed that to them regularly, then go for it. Uh, on the other hand, if you're taking care of 20 cats and paying for food is a strain and you're just doing the best you can, then getting those big bags of dry food is perfectly fine. So balance, you know, for what you can afford, get the best quality that that uh, part of your budget will allow. And whatever you end up buying, you know, you're doing a great thing. So again, not trying to say you should, everybody should go out there and buy high quality wet food. We just want you to take the funds that you are spending already and try to maximize the nutrition with those. So we asked this, um, uh, this website that does a lot of articles about cats. It's called allaboutcats.com and there's the link. And they wrote an article for us called 
what is the best food for feeding feral cats? So if you go to that website and you do a search for that article, you'll get all that information. Just to summarize it, here's uh, the five brands of food. Uh, notice they're all dry food, because dry food is definitely, um, you know, you get more for your, for your buck. But these brands uh, and their investigation is what they decided was the best combination of uh, cost and quality. And just so you guys know, the Kirkland Signature Maintenance Cat Chicken and Rice Formula, that's Costco's store brand. So if you're feeding a lot of cats, you know, investing in a Costco uh, card, a membership card, it's like $60 a year, lets you get in there and buy what is an excellent uh, value for dry food. Uh, these other ones are very good too. You can usually find them on Amazon. Okay, um, also just a, a tip, um, a cheap hack, and this would be, uh, I would really recommend reading The Natural Cat by Anitra Frazier before you dive into this, but you can greatly improve the nutrition of whatever you're feeding, especially wet food. You don't want to mix this in with dry food, but um, adding raw ground beef to the cat's diet will uh, greatly improve the nutrition. And uh, I want to emphasize that if you're feeding raw, if you're uncomfortable feeding raw, then cooking it a little bit and then adding it will also, um, you mix a little uh, lightly cooked hamburger in with um, a store brand wet food and that nutrition, the value, uh, uh, nutritional value has greatly increased. Um, but if you're okay with raw, you just need to make sure it's very fresh, like it was just put out that day on the shelf. And um, you want to balance the, the raw meat with um, calcium. That's really important. So you can use either calcium lactate, one tablespoon for each uh, pound of ground beef, or bone meal. Uh, and you can get those usually at the health food store. And again, one tablespoon. So one tablespoon of calcium lactate or bone meal for each pound of ground beef. And you can you know, use half that or quarter of that um, proportionately and then mix that in. Just make sure it's very fresh and, and make sure the cats eat, you know, don't leave it out in the sun. Um, but if they eat it right away, and for people who are like, uh, you know, a little like, huh, ground, you know, raw, giving raw meat to cats. Well, you know, when they, when they catch a mouse, they, they don't barbecue it before they eat it. So that's a natural part of their diet. It just has to be very fresh in order to evolve, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in order to avoid any type of um, bacterial infections. So now let's talk about uh, where to feed the cats. And um, this is really important. I found this out myself. Uh, so this is a colony that, that I took care of many years ago in, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I used to have to feed through a fence that adjoined a sidewalk. So it was very visible to people coming by. And as a result, every year, a cat or two would be uh, dropped off at the location. And then I would have to catch them and find them a home. And when the, the property manager finally um, trusted me, he gave me a key to it so I could get into this yard and not have to feed by the sidewalk. And the first thing I did was put the food behind this these pile of large rocks that you see uh, this kitty eating, Misty is her name. and. Uh, after I started hiding the food and water from public site, I never had another cat abandoned at that location. So low visibility. Uh, it also just it's just better in general for for cats in areas to be as low profile as possible. It just means you're going to invite less possible issues. Um, now, if you're in a situation where you don't have to worry about that, that's great. Everybody loves the cats in the area. There's no issues. Then then that's great. But if you do have to deal with that. Think about low visibility. So if, if you're feeding cats in your front yard and you could just as easily feed them in the back, then, then feed them in the back. Um, you want to have the feeding have as little impact on neighbors or other uh, workers where you are as, uh, as possible. You know, keep it uh, safe and quiet. Of course, it has to be accessible for you. And if you're um, in an area where there's any kind of threatened wildlife, you know, where there's birds or other little animals that, um, might be at risk for cat predation, especially if they're 
considered rare or endangered or threatened, then you want to feed the cats as far away from that habitat, especially breeding grounds as possible. So just something to keep in mind. So avoid putting food on the ground. And um, this is a common complaint that we hear from people who really aren't you know, become um, hostile with the cats. And the reason for this is because if they don't eat all the food, then it just stays there and it attracts uh, rodents, attracts other animals, it's, it's unsightly. Um, so when people have problems with uh, caretakers and cats and the area and stuff, it's often because the feeding is being done in this kind of a way where it's just being dropped on the ground. And um, so try to avoid doing that. And what you want to do instead is use some type of container like a plastic uh, plate or, or even a piece of cardboard and um, something that you can uh, pick up and remove when the cats are done eating. So again, if, you, if you're doing this on a feeding pattern, they're all showing up, you put out the food, uh, they eat it, you take it away. Um, if you're in a situation where you can't uh, wait, then we'll talk about feeding stations and things like that. But, or or put the you know food in a discreet place. But the idea is that it's you're not going to walk away and leave a whole bunch of food on the ground. Um, this is going to make the situation much neater. So clean up. You may, you may have gathered that. So this is, uh, you know, if you live next door to this scene here, you probably would not be very happy about the cats, right? Um, it's, as I said, it's the number one complaint that we hear. So um, when you're feeding off of objects, try to avoid paper plates and things that easily blow away once they're empty, if you're not going to be there um, when the cats are done. Also, pick up all the trash in the area. Uh, when I fed my colony in that lot, I didn't just pick up the, the cat food cans and the plates and stuff like that. And if there was a plastic bag in the lot, whatever it was, I made myself a good neighbor and kept the area clean. Uh, don't make the mistake of putting everything in a trash bag and then leaving that bag somewhere on the site where the cats can just rip it open or wildlife can rip it open or possibly even suffocate if they get stuck in it. So put all the trash in a bag and then take the bag away. Feeding stations. Um, if you can put a feeding station out, it's just a great thing to do. And what it allows you to do is to uh, hide the food and the dishes and the supplies. You can keep everything in there uh, as long as, of course, the cats can't open it. And it also protects the food and the water from the elements and helps every again keep everything pretty clean and neat. Notice in this feeding station how large the opening is. So what you don't want is a, a feeding station is not like a winter shelter. You don't want a small doorway because what will happen is one big dominant cat will go inside and then none of the other cats will be able to come in until he's decided he's uh, he's done. And if he wants to take a nap in there, then they're going to be waiting a long time. So you want to keep the opening really large. If you do use smaller openings, then use multiple doorways so that cats can come in and out on either end of the feeding station. And here's some more examples just to give you ideas. People are very creative about this stuff. You can see on the upper left there, somebody um, just took a Rubbermaid or, or 30 gallon trash can and turned it on its side and uh, you know wedged it in, and that works quite well. Uh, you can see the 55 gallon storage bin, and the note you can take uh, a uh, box cutter or any type of sharp uh, razor blade, just be very careful obviously, or an X-Acto knife, and just trace the doorway in the plastic and just uh, don't press down too hard, just keep running the blade over the, lines that you've traced over and over um, and eventually you'll cut all the way through and notice that the opening is is quite large on the bottom left is a smaller storage bin where the small doorway is cut in the side what you're not seeing is on the other side of that bin is another doorway that looks exactly the same so the cats can come in and out on either end uh, if those of you who are handy, you can you can build your own 
a wooden feeding station out of plywood and a couple of um, pieces of wood, two by fours and two by twos that you see on the upper right. And for those of you who just want somebody else to do the labor, you can order feeding stations from, um, uh, gee, that's a little, the, the name of the company is Feral Via. I'm sorry, it's not large Feral Via and small Feral Via. It's a large station and a small station from a company called Feral Via. And just go onto their website and uh, you can order either the small one or the large one. And um, they're very, very well made. So if you decide uh, to, to pay for them, uh, you'll get uh, very good value. Now, here's another idea. If you wanna get really creative and hide your um, feeding station, and again, these, these are a little pricey. So, uh, you know, not unless you really have to, but sometimes they can be a really good investment and solve the problem and that are these mock rocks. And what you're seeing um, in this ad is what's called the extra large artificial landscape rock. And they're hollow. Uh, that's what you're not seeing here. There's nothing inside them. And there's the link to this particular one um, at Outdoor Essential Products. And obviously you can, in the middle of an open field, you can keep the feeding station uh, hidden this way. You just cut a doorway uh, on the side where people aren't or two doorways on side where people are not seeing it. Uh, these are actually very lightweight. They come in a whole range of sizes and shapes. The way to cut the doorway, what we've been told from people with experience with this, is you use a handheld jigsaw. Um, that's the best way to do this without cracking the whole thing and ruining it. But you can also make your own artificial rocks. Uh, just do a, um, a YouTube search for how to make a hollow faux rock cover. And um, you'll see um, there's a whole bunch of videos if, if you want to save some money and do it yourself. Gravity feeders and um, auto waterers can come in very handy in um, situations where uh, feeding regularly is really uh, difficult. Um, you may have limited access. You may be only able to get in once every few days or once a week. Um, you may uh, be going away for a few days. And in which case, these can be very, very handy, uh, either under a protected uh, stairwell or uh, inside a feeding station. Um, try to use the smaller feeders or waterers uh, because, um, you know, especially the larger waterers, you're going to need to replace them pretty regularly. The, ideally, you would be changing the water every day or as, if you can't, as often as you can. So there's no point in getting like a five-gallon a water jug because you're going to have to lug five gallons of water in every day and that obviously that isn't making much sense if you can use a smaller one and it's just a gallon of water that's going to be a lot easier to maintain the feeders uh, you can go larger if you need to they do tend to keep the food pretty fresh keep in mind though that when you're leaving food out like this 24 7 um, you could potentially attract wildlife rodents or other cats so um, our advice is use them when you need them. But if you don't have to use them, uh, you're probably going to be uh, better off and, and just attracting less attention, especially from other animals. A few tips. Um, if it's, uh, you don't have a feeding station and it's, and it's raining or it's about to rain, you know, how do you do that? And what we used to do is uh, take a takeout dish, like a deli dish like that with a cover, uh, fill it up with dry food and then turn the top upside down. And what happens is the, the top will keep um, all or most of the rain out. And then when the rain stops, the cats come over, they just nudge the top off and voila, there's their, their meal. The Vittles Vault is a great thing if you want to, if you're able to store food on site, it um, keeps it very fresh. Uh, and also, uh, that arm extender, that's what I used to do when I had to feed through the fence. So I would at least try to uh, get the food by using the arm extender. I could push, and, and the arm extender, that's what you see in stores when you go in and they're trying to get something off the top shelf. They're pretty inexpensive items, like 10 or $15. And I would take that and push the food away from the fence uh, out of arm's reach of the sidewalk. So there was at least that protection. And sometimes you can use it to, to grab 
older dishes or push the food into a hidden spot. So just a tool if you need it. Talk about feeding in the winter time for a bit. So uh, cats actually expend more calories in colder temperatures. And the reason for that is um, they need to uh, keep warm. So that burns a lot of calories and they're actually more active in colder weather. In the summertime, they tend to sleep more. So the research on this suggests that they need about 15% more food in the winter time. So keep that in mind that uh, you wanna up the amount that you're feeding if you're in a cold climate and you're getting into winter. Um, clearing a path. So if it snows, uh, it's very helpful for the kitties if you can uh, make a path to their feeding station and help them to move around and they don't have to deal with the snow drifts. But keep in mind that typical um, rock salt and chemical de-icers, things like that can be uh, either highly irritating or even toxic uh, for cats. So if you want to do that, here's a safe solution, which is a teaspoon of Dawn dish detergent, a tablespoon of rubbing alcohol, half gallon of warm water, pretty simple, mix it together. Then you can spray or pour it on the ice to melt it away. And that will be perfectly safe for the cats. Water in winter time is a real challenge. Uh, so um, healthy cats don't need a lot of water but they do need some and it needs to be available on a daily basis. And it's especially important in uh, the winter time when you may have to rely on dry food as your main source because the wet food uh, freezes, uh, may freeze too quickly. So uh, it it's, it's kind of a double challenge. They, they need more water, but it's harder to provide it for them because, um, because it freezes. So one, thing to do and another good reason to have a feeding pattern is if the cats uh, are present, you can slip them a little bit of uh, dry of wet food before it freezes and mix a little bit of water, uh, like a tablespoon of water into the wet food before you put the dish down. And if they'll eat that like while you're there and the, before the food freezes, they'll get enough water, a healthy cat, a tablespoon of water mixed into their wet food is going to um, really help a lot with keeping uh, them hydrated. But there are things you can do to either stop the water from freezing or at least slow it down. And here's some products that, that are out there that you can buy. Um, again, they're not going to work for everybody, but in case you're in a situation where they will work, they're good to know about. So on the left there is this product called a solar sipper. And basically the lid, the white part of the product um, draws in the sun and solar heat and it will keep the water from freezing down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit is what they advertise. And um, that seems to be correct from feedback that we get. And you can find it at Garden's Edge at that um, URL, but also you can search on Amazon to find, uh, to find these. So in the middle there, you see an electric heated bowl, and those are great. That completely prevents water from freezing. Of course, you have to be in a place where it's safe to leave it and be able to plug it in. But if you're feeding cats on your back porch or somewhere secure like that, it may work well. Uh, keep in mind that uh, the water will evaporate relatively quickly uh, because it's, its temperature relative to the air temperature is going to be much higher. So you need to get, don't get a small one, uh, get a relatively large one, like at least, um, I think this one may be a half gallon, um, or let's see, I'm not sure if you, a couple of quarts, but don't go smaller, go larger, and be prepared to um, fill it, you know, at least daily. I mean, you might have to fill it twice daily on a very cold day just be aware of evaporation. And what you're seeing here is sort of the luxury model. It's got a, a protected cord, outdoor cord, it has a stainless steel um, inner, inner insert, which helps the cats, you know, not get bacteria infections on their chins. And um, it's, it's kind of the top of the line, but you can find much cheaper ones that are made of plastic that work perfectly well. This is just one example. If you um, look at electric uh, heated pet bowl 
uh, search for that on Amazon, you'll see probably dozens of choices. And at the top there is a thing called Snuggle Safe. And that's made for, uh, it's designed for pet cats. And basically it's that, you take that red Frisbee thing, you stick it in your microwave, uh, leave it in there for a few minutes, it heats up. And then you put it in that pad and it retains the heat for hours and kitty can um, sleep on a nice toasty bed. But it's also great for colony caretakers if you can take one of those and put it under the water bowl or under the food bowl and have a source of heat underneath it that will last, you know, depending on how cold it is. Um, but it will make the water, stop, prevent the water from freezing for some period of time. You can also use these, we're going to talk later about winter shelters for cats. This is also a product that you can you can put inside a winter shelter to provide a little, a little extra heat inside there too. And as long as you put them, uh, don't um, overcook them so that they melt and uh, put them in the cloth sleeve, the cats will be safe. What you don't want to do is overheat them, not put them in the sleeve. And, you know, if it's too hot for you to hold them, then it's probably too hot for the cats to be lying or touching them. Here's some do-it-yourself ideas. Um, you can uh, get a styrofoam cooler. Uh, if you're gonna go this route, you wanna look for these in the summertime because they can be hard to find in the winter. And um, basically just cut a hole, uh, take, take a box cutter, it'll slice right through it like butter and um, cut a little doorway and put the bowl of water inside the cooler so that cats have to stick their head in or walk into the cooler. And the cooler from the insulation will slow, it won't stop the freezing, but it will slow it down. Using um, the kind of bowl you use will have a lot to do with how quickly or slowly the water freezes. So what you're looking for is deep, wide, and thick, uh, and a plastic bowl. And uh, there's an example of one, the Pet May Croc Bowl. It's a 10 cup bowl that you can get on Amazon. You can um, get uh, a really creative idea that we've seen is you can get a little styrofoam shipping box, like a small one, like six inches by eight inches, the kind they sometimes ship vaccines in um, or other uh, products that need to be um, kept cool in shipment. And uh, put cut a little opening like the solar sipper opening on the top in the lid, a little round, maybe three inch opening, line the um, body of the shipping box with plastic, like just a garbage bag or something like that. And then fill that with water, put the lid on, and that cats, the cats can sip the water through the lid, through the opening in the lid, but the styrofoam will insulate the water and keep it, um, keep it warm for a much longer period of time. And then finally at the bottom there is, kind of an idea that a lot of horse owners use in their meadows to provide water for the horses. Uh, they'll take an old tire and stuff the inner tube with rocks and um, then um, let that sit in the sun all day and get hot and then um, put a bucket of water right in the middle of it and then the rocks will uh, radiate, the, the, the tire will um, keep the heat insulated and the rocks will radiate it to the bucket of water and keep that from freezing. So you wanna leave the rocks out, let them get nice and warm in the sun, stick them in an inner tube, and then put the bucket of water in the middle. So uh, granted, there's probably not too many caretakers who can use that trick, but if anybody can, there you go. So how do you deal with ants? Well, the short answer is that they can't swim. So any kind of insect that walks, you know, crawls along the ground that doesn't fly is not going to be able to cross water to get to the food bowl. So you can purchase um, ant-proof cat food bowls. You can see on the lower right there, the Neater Feeder. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Again, if you do a search for ant-proof uh, pet bowls, you're going to find dozens and dozens to choose from. We always prefer, when possible, the stainless steel just because it's better for the cat's health. Um, sometimes, you know, that's not possible. But you can also just do it yourself. So here in this photo, what you see is a, um, you know, baking pan with a, maybe a quarter inch of water in it. 
and then we put the food bowl right in the middle. So the cats can easily reach over and eat, but there's no way for the ants to reach it. Uh, flies um, are a real problem. And, and sometimes uh, that's something that uh, we've seen health inspectors complain about, you know, that uh, cat food is attracting flies. So keep in mind that flies are most attracted to wet food on high days, on hot days. So if you put out a can of wet food and leave it there at noon during the summer, you're going to get a lot of flies. Uh, on the other hand, the flies are much less attracted to dry food. So if you have to feed during a hot part of the day, uh, you might choose dry food if flies are um, being a big problem. Another thing is to keep in mind is that uh, flies sleep at night. So if you train the cats to eat at sundown, at least during the summertime at dusk, uh, you'll, you'll pretty much eliminate the problem of flies. And again, for those of you who wanna get really fancy, and I'll tell you, if you check out this video on this product, it makes you want to buy one, even if you don't need it. Uh, both Cece and I looked at the video and we're like, we have to have one. And then we're like, but we don't need it. Uh, but it's so cool the way it works. It's motion activated, the SureFeed sealed pet bowl. And um, when uh, an animal comes near the, uh, the food bowl, the lid uh, automatically opens up. And then when they walk away, it automatically closes. And it doesn't, um, it has a very gentle accordion type of motion. That's, that's very cool. And um, it's great for a colony of cats because um, they sell these actually that are sensitive to microchips. So if you have a cat at home, a pet cat who has a special diet, but your other cats are always eating it, you can um, get one of these bowls that will only open in for the particular microchip that the cat has. So that's pretty cool. But this model will open uh, anytime uh, an object or you know a body comes by. So that is one way to keep the flies out is to um, not have the food exposed when the cats aren't eating. Slugs are another problem people often come across. Um, it has been reported to us and, and it makes a lot of sense um, that if you make a circle of diatomaceous earth, which is that bag you see there on the right. And diatomaceous earth is just these, um, it's, it's almost like a, a, a marine, very, very tiny um, uh, organism. And when they die, they leave uh, shells behind. And to, to the human touch, it feels like soft chalk. But um, on the microscopic level, they're actually quite sharp. And, um, and a slug or um, any kind of insect really is going, a slug will not cross that because it's too sharp, it's too painful. So if you uh, draw a circle around your feeding area, the slugs will not cross it. And, but make sure you buy, there's, there's two kinds of diatomaceous earth. There's food grade, which is perfectly safe. If, even if the cats ate it, it would be fine. Um, but then there's also what's called pool grade, P-O-O-L, and that's not healthy. Uh, for anybody to ingest. So make sure you buy only food grade. You can also try crushed eggshells or chalk powder. It's the same idea. Uh, you can put the food bowl on a sheet of sandpaper and the slugs will not cross the sandpaper. Another thing you can try, um, which I actually used to do, was I found that um, you know slugs are like all of us and if they can do something more easily, they'll choose that. So I would put a little bit of food on the ground just a few feet away from the cat's bowl and they would go there and eat that rather than having to climb up the side of the cat bowl. So that's that's your poor man's way of uh, dealing it with it for sure. But you can keep them out of the food. Um, wildlife, uh, yeah, can be a big problem if you're in an area where there's a lot of it, a lot of them, I should say. So generally the rule is to feed during daylight hours because most wildlife, um, except for birds, are nocturnal. Uh, it's not 100%. You will occasionally you know, get a raccoon who's decided to wander around during the daytime, but the vast majority of them come out at night. So if you can train the cats to eat during a window of time, say between 5 and 6 p.m., and don't leave any uneaten food behind, you, you can tell this is a theme that I keep hitting, is whenever you can avoid leaving food out, you want to. But if, if they all come and they eat from five to six, 
you're going to minimize your your problems with any wildlife. Um, also, obviously, keeping the feeding area clean is going to help a lot. Uh, another, and now if you can't do that, or the raccoons are coming during the day and you, you can't uh, feed at night, this is just one solution that um, our creative community has come up with. And that's a, 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 feeder, a feeding station that is basically immune to raccoons and opossum and skunks and any wildlife that is able to climb quite well, but they can't jump uh, up. These, these guys can jump across, they can jump horizontally, but they have a lot of, uh, they're not, a raccoon can't jump um, vertically, uh, not very far. So uh, you, what you see in the photo there, it has uh, three main elements. Uh, there's the platform on top there, which is two foot square. It's uh, raised 40 inches off the ground on a four by four post. And you can cover part of the platform like this one is, you can see it's a, you know, they go inside that little almost cabin-like uh, structure to eat, but you need to leave, you can't cover the whole thing because the cats need space to uh, jump up onto. So leave part of that platform um, un, uh, open and not covered. And the main feature, what makes this work is that metal skirt that you see around the bottom of the platform. and so the raccoon can climb the four by four post, that wooden post that the whole thing's standing on, but then they have nothing to grab onto. That metal skirt it will just slide, they'll just slide right off that. Um, so it really prevents them from being able to climb any further. Notice on the lower right of the photo, there's what's called a jump up platform. And that's just to give some of the older cats a little boost up so they can, a cat can, get on the jump up thing and then get a little bit of a head start on getting up on top of the platform. Um, you don't want to make the jump up platform too high because uh, as I say, raccoons can jump horizontally, I've seen it. Um, so don't make it level or even close to level. Uh, the cats will have to jump up in order to get to the food. And uh, thank you to Forgotten Feline. So Forsyth for uh, making this um, and taking the photo. So what about birds? Um, well, they're they're the opposite of most wildlife and they're, they're diurnal and they're inactive at night um, and they're out and about during the day. So this would be just the opposite. So you, you would um, not feed during the day like you would with raccoons, you would feed at night. Now, of course, if you've got um, birds and raccoons, uh, then you've got a <laughs> you've got a problem, and you know you can try to feed at dawn or at dusk um, when you're going to minimize the presence of both. But it, uh, there are ways to keep the birds out of a feeding station, and one of the ways that you can see here is just some plastic strips, uh, like not not very thick, like maybe a three or four millimeter drop cloth, and they're duct taped over the opening into the feeding station. So the cats have no hesitation once they learn the ropes to just brush right through the plastic and go into the feeding station, but birds are going to be very reluctant to pass through that plastic. So you can try that. And another trick and another recurrent theme you're hearing is you can feed the birds separately if you have to. So here in Maui, um, it's a, there's, there's a huge feral chicken population which is really, you know, when you first come here, it's really quite amazing, but there are feral, there are more feral chickens than there are feral cats. And they are ferocious when it comes to food. They'll just drive the, they literally, a rooster will drive the cats away from their food. They're, they're so tough um, that, it, it, you know, if you're trying to trap uh, and there are chickens around, it's impossible because they'll, they, they invade. So what we learn to do is we buy a big, if we're gonna go trap, and there's a lot of cats. Um, we buy a bag of cracked corn, which is almost nothing. You can get it at a feed store. Uh, Walmart's around here sells it. But they come in these giant bags at like 40 pounds for, you know, six dollars. And you uh, just make a pile of it uh, off on the side, and then the birds all run over there and eat the cracked corn, and they leave your traps alone. And we've seen feeders do the same thing here, where they'll they'll 
dump a whole bunch of cracked corn on the ground um, and let the birds go eat that. And then they go off and put out the cat food. One last poll question before we go. I want to skip to the one, Stacy, about how how old is your oldest cat? All right, here's a poll for folks. How old is your oldest cat? We have not too old, less than 10 years old, about 10 to 13 years, really old, maybe 14 to 16, ancient, probably 17 plus. I remember in the days when seven was thought to be old. Yeah, yeah, things have changed a lot. So 55% have not too old, less than 10 years, 31% old, about 10 to 13 years, really old, maybe 14 to 16, and ancient, probably uh, 17 plus, so that's about 4% and 10% at that 14 to 16 range, 31%, 10 to 13. So that's still, there's a good, good amount of older cats out there. Yeah, that's a lot of, of 10 year and older cats. And it just goes to show you how much uh, we've advanced in terms of taking care of these guys and that, um, you know, they, they can live very long and uh, healthy and, and happy lives. Uh, if they're cared for properly. And uh, that, that's just great to see. Yeah, you know, when I started this work 20 years ago, yeah, it, it was unheard of to see uh, older outdoor cats. But um, now we have we have a lot of them and there's a whole new bunch of challenges that have come up. That's a topic for another day of, you know, how do you take care of these geriatric colony cats? Cats are uh, very good uh, during the winter time at finding places where they can stay dry, but they often need our help to uh, stay warm during the winter. And there's a, a whole bunch of uh, creative ways to do this, but good winter shelter always has three qualities. One, it's waterproof. Uh, two, it's, it's well insulated, meaning it's made of a material that captures and holds heat. And then finally, there's minimal um, empty air space. So what's happening is that the shelter is capturing the cat's body heat and using that heat to warm the interior. So if it's not well insulated, then the, their body heat's just going to escape through the walls. If there's too much empty air space, their body heat will not be enough to warm up the space. So you want to make sure you put out the right size shelter for the colony of cats that you have. This particular shelter that you're looking at is um, you can, uh, if you're in the New York City area, you can buy them from uh, this gentleman at uh, wintercatshelter.com. And there are fish boxes that are used, I guess, for salmon and things like that. And what uh, Joe does is he cuts an opening that you see the kitty sticking his head out of, wraps the whole thing in um, drum plastic and uh, plastic drum liners, I'm sorry. and then uh, he attaches the plastic drum liner with a uh, heat welded plastic straps. And um, these can, they come in different sizes. Uh, the bigger ones can hold like five, six, seven cats at once. And like I say, you want to, you don't want to have a giant shelter for one or two cats because um, they won't be able to stay warm. You'd want a smaller one. This is uh, the neighborhood cats uh, winter shelter that's being uh, put together. And uh, basically what this is, is it's an eight foot, uh, two inch thick piece of styro hard styrofoam that's uh, cut up into pieces. Every last uh, square inch is used. And then the pieces are silicone glued together. And uh, the outside is uh, painted, should be painted with a deck paint. And you can put a self-sticking linoleum uh, tile floor in there as well. But if you want the plants for this, and we do recommend you get these pieces cut with a table saw because of the thickness. We have had people do it by hand, but makes it uh, much easier if you get a nice straight cut. Uh, just go to our website at this link, Feral Cat Winter Shelter, and um, scroll down that page and you'll see downloadable plans. Here's another idea from a group based in uh, Queens, New York called CSM Stray Foundation. And they basically took a storage bin um, cut a doorway in it that you can see that square doorway, line the floor, uh, the walls and the top with a, looks like a one inch thick styrofoam. And they didn't glue it together. They just uh, made it so it kind of, they snugly fit, stuff the bottom with straw. And voila, you have a um, 
insulated winter shelter. So you can also get the plans for this, uh, instructions on how to build it, and as well as a host of other uh, great do-it-yourself ideas if you go to our uh, Feral Cat Winter Shelter uh, website page at uh, the link you see here. Another real simple idea is to get a styrofoam shipping box. Uh, again, they're used for meat, fish, vaccines, and um, you can just uh, cut a doorway like you see there, keep it about six inches round or square. So unlike the feeding stations with the winter shelters, we want the doorways to be as small as possible to let uh, less air in. Uh, make sure you cut it so that the, the, the bottom of the doorway is a few inches off the ground in case there's uh, rain or smelting snow, things like that, so the water doesn't get into the shelter. Glue the top on, unless it's really tight fitting, glue the top on with a silicone glue, and then uh, use deck paint to camouflage the shelter. So that's a real easy, and again, stuff it with straw. We'll talk about what you put inside these shelters. But that this particular shelter will keep one or two cats extremely warm over the winter time. So another thing people ask, um, I would anticipate a question coming up is, should there be more than one doorway? And um, generally, uh, we say no, that uh, unless you're dealing, unless you're in an area with coyotes or some large uh, predator animal that um, is really a risk or the place is overrun with um, uh, raccoons or things like that, uh, Generally, it's not a good idea to have two doorways because then you're potentially creating drafts and that will greatly lessen the ability of um, the shelter to keep the cats warm. So unless there's a real specific threat, um, but the general idea that the cats should always need a way to escape is just not something we've seen. Um, we don't, it, it's very rare that we've uh, ever heard of a cat getting trapped inside of a winter shelter. If you do use two doorways, then you have to put flaps over them in order to prevent the drafts. So something like a styrofoam shelter like this one, you might get um, these plastic uh, nuts and screws, the kind that attach toilet bowl seats onto the toilet and uh, take a drill or poke a hole above the doorway and then use a the, uh, piece of plastic or something like a thin vinyl rubber mat and you and create a mat that the cats can pull back and get inside. Um, and you would need to do that for both doorways in order to prevent drafts. In general, um, we don't uh, see flaps as needed that much, um, but if you want to go through uh, putting one on, the process of putting one on, and then what, what you should do is first train the cats to go into these shelters without a flap over the door. And then once they're used to going in, then put the flap on and uh, they'll figure out how to open it and get inside. Again, for those of you who um, uh, would much rather fill out a credit card form than try to glue together pieces of styrofoam, completely understand that. Um, we have Ferrovia again, um, a, a small firm in Indiana that manufactures these and this is their outdoor cat shelter and uh, extremely well made. And um, just check out this link uh, and, and you can get the specifications and it's you put it together yourself, but it's not a complicated um, Not complicated to do. It's just screwing a few pieces together mostly Now uh, if you need an emergency winter shelter So big storms coming and you haven't had a chance to build something or buy something You can make a good shelter temporary shelter out of two cardboard boxes um, you put a box inside a box, you fill in the space between the two boxes with newspaper, with rolled up newspaper. You wrap the whole thing in plastic, could be a drop cloth or a large trash bag, and then you duct tape the plastic onto the uh, cardboard box. And um, the plans for this, again, same on our Fer Feral Cat Winter Shelter page, you can get a step-by-step -step description about how to build one of these, but you can put these together very, very quickly and notice a couple of things about this about this photo um, that are relevant to all winter shelters. So number one, notice that uh, this person had uh, other winter shelters that are right across from the cardboard uh, box one. And 
the doorways are facing each other and there's a board put across the top to bridge the gap. And you see the kitty, there's a black kitty right there in the middle underneath the board. So what this does is by having the doorways face each other, it breaks the wind from coming in. And then having that board spanning the um, a space between them creates a little uh, like a porch or a little protected area that the cats can come out of the shelters and be out of the elements. So um, also notice how both uh, shelters, the one on the right and the cardboard one on the left, both have planters sitting on top of them. It shows you how strong these cardboard shelters can be. So um, these shelters, we're talking about the styrofoam and the cardboard, they're very light, lightweight. So you often need to put something heavy on top of them to, to weigh them down so they don't blow away in a strong wind. And then also notice how the cardboard shelter is lifted a few inches off the ground. So that's always a good idea too. When you're um, first starting to use these shelters, uh, you can you can attract the cats inside by using if they don't naturally just go in, then you can try putting catnip inside uh, to to lure them and in in there and get them used to going in. So placement and camouflage are two very important things. So this is a photo of what not to do, and I suspect what happened was somebody got these. These are the neighborhood cats winter shelters, the pink styrofoam, unpainted, and Obviously, you can see from this photo how they, they stick out like a sore thumb, and that we don't want that. Um, we don't want to be drawing attention to where the cats are sleeping and, and otherwise hanging out. So, you know, uh, I'm assuming this person just had a rush and had to get these out there. But in general, you want to paint them. You want to camouflage them and make them blend in and be as discreet as possible. If you can situate the winter shelters near where the cats eat, or you can even, if you see, they, this person does have boards spanning, see how the doorways are facing each other, and there's a large board that's spanning uh, the distance between them, so that can become a feeding station underneath the boards, but if you have a separate feeding area, try to keep the shelters as close to that as possible so that in bad weather, the cats don't have to travel very far. They can just go from their shelter to the feeding station and quickly go back um, if they want to. So let's talk a little bit about what you put inside the shelter, if anything. So the big thing to remember is the best insulation is straw. It's not hay, never use hay. Um, hay is, uh, people tend to confuse the two and think they're the same thing, but straw is dry. It's, it's um, has no moisture in it. Hay is very moist. It's a, it's a feed. And if you, put really moist hay inside of a winter shelter, it will uh, grow mold and that can really negatively impact the cat's health. So make sure you're using straw. And that's the best material because you can just stuff it in there and what the cats do is they burrow into it. They get in it and it, then they, when they're sleeping, they're surrounded by the straw, which is like having a blanket over them. Um, another idea, if you can't get straw, is just use shredded newspaper. Again, it's something the cats can burrow into, and that's very good insulation. For real extreme cold temperatures, like some, some folks up in Canada, what they'll do is they'll get these mylar blankets, which are these thin, almost aluminum looking uh, sheets. Uh, they're, they're meant for uh, keeping in your car for uh, emergencies in the wintertime. So if you, your car all of a sudden died and it was 20 degrees outside and you were stuck for a couple hours, you pull out one of these mylar blankets and you wrap it around you, it captures your body heat and will keep you safe and warm until you can get help. So what people do sometimes is they line the interior of their shelters or the floor or the ceiling with a mylar blanket and then the cat's body heat is reflected back at them and it keeps it extra warm inside. Along the same ideas, there's this product called the Purr Pad um, made by now by a company, Carolina Pet. And you can get it at Petco at that link. And it's the same idea. It, it absorbs the cat's body heat and then it reflects it back at them. So um, this is one of the rare things that you can put on the floor 
that lies flat. Um, now, opposed to that, you see a big don't do it symbol with the flat newspaper or blankets or towels because those actually, the cats can only lie on top of them and they absorb the body heat and don't reflect it back. So they will actually make the cat colder instead of warmer. So never put like a flat blanket or a flat um, towel or even flat newspaper inside of a winter shelter. Now, if you, um, all of these things, especially the shredded newspaper and the straw, you, you need to be able to check and replace periodically. So if you're in a situation where that's not possible and you, you can't, you know, check and make sure nothing's wet, make sure everything's clean, then just don't put anything inside and the cats um, will be okay as long as you've got, you know, your the basic structure of your shelter is okay. This stuff is added comfort, added warmth. So let's move from winter shelters into um, neighbors and, and, and neighbor relations. And, um, you know, that's often something that we come upon is people don't really understand the work or why you're taking care of the cats or they wish the cats weren't there or the cats may be causing some kind of problems. The number one thing to realize in dealing with these issues is you're gonna get the, the furthest, the fastest in terms of protecting the cats and making the situation okay if the first thing you do is just listen to your neighbor and um, try to understand what the problem is. Because you know maybe you just started managing the colony and not all the cats are fixed yet. And the, and the, the person um, who's living next to them is getting woken up in the middle of the night every night because of cat fights or things like that. Or maybe there's a big tom who's spraying in the backyard and they can't use it because it smells so horrible. So people have complaints um, often for very good reasons. And if you just listen and try to understand that, first of all, just the act of listening and empathizing will help calm the situation down and get that person to understand you're, you want to help them. You don't want to argue with them. You also want to explain what you're doing, how TNR works and how you're, what you're doing is going to help the situation. You know, the fact that uh, once the cats are spayed or neutered, a lot of these nuisance behaviors go away. That's why we spay and neuter our indoor pet cats because they would be pretty tough to live with if we didn't. And then you wanna seek solutions to their specific problems. And we'll talk about some of those possible solutions, but the, don't meet hostility with hostility because that just escalates the situation and doesn't do any good for the cats at all. So if somebody comes at you and they're really angry and they say something really stupid, don't react angrily, you know, just, Listen, it's just say, okay, well, specifically, what is the problems that you're having? Um, and then empathize with that and explain what you're doing. Go through these steps. But if they, you know, come up to you and they say, well, you know, why are you feeding these cats? It's making my life miserable. You should get rid of them and we should get rid of you. And your first reaction is, well, you know, the cats were here before you were, so you should go away. Well, that's not really going to end up helping the situation. So, um, one of the things that's unique about TNR and that's unique about colony caretaking in a lot of situations is it's not about just the cats. It's also about community relations. It's also about working with people. So we need to make sure that we use the right people skills and not um, ignore, ignore that side of the work. So let's talk about some of the solutions and um, Look, if somebody doesn't want cats in their backyard, then you know that's their yard, and they certainly have a right to to that opinion. So, you can use deterrence in a reasonably sized uh, space to keep cats away. And there are two kinds: there's motion-activated sprinklers, like you see on the right, and there's ultrasonic devices um, that you see on the left. And the sprinkler does just what it says: it's, it shoots out an infrared field. And when a cat enters that field, it shoots out a burst of water. It doesn't get the cat wet, but it's kind of violent and startling enough that it scares the cats away. And eventually um, they learn not to enter the infrared field and you don't even need the sprinkler anymore. Now, obviously you can't start doing this in the winter time because the water will freeze. It hooks up to a hose. So you wanna train the cats while the weather's still warm enough. Um, 
for the hose to work. On the left, the, the yard guard, the um, ultrasonic device is the same idea. It sends out an infrared field and it shoots off uh, a very high pitched sound that we can't hear as humans, but the cats can and it's highly annoying. Um, and these can be very effective. So we love the motion activated sprinkler. You can see it working. It's like 100% effective. They do not want to enter that field and get sprayed at. The ultrasonic devices are also very effective, but what we found is people don't know how to use them properly. So they often think they don't work. So the first thing to do is make sure you download the handout that we have there on how to use an ultrasonic cat deterrent, because it goes into what I'm talking about in even more detail. Um, it's not hard to do, but it's just certain basic steps. If you don't know to take them, like putting the device at the right height, uh, you'll think they just don't work. So the main things when you, you're looking at this, so you want to make sure you buy, uh, and, and if you go onto Amazon, again, you'll find dozens of these. So make sure you read the reviews and um, they have different features like strobe lights and different sounds and 16 settings for 15 different animals. And, you know, the real simple ones are fine. Um, just make sure they match what you need. And one of the things you need to match is the range. So if you buy um, an ultrasonic device that doesn't emit an infrared field that's far enough, um, then obviously it's not the cats aren't going to set it off. So make sure the range, which is how far forward it goes and at what angle, uh, matches the space that you're trying to cover. I mentioned the correct height. So uh, the infrared field is sent out on the level of the device. So if you put it up on a three foot post and the cats are all down on the ground, they're not gonna enter the field. The field will be shot over their heads and they'll never set the devices off. So you have to set them um, maybe six to eight inches off the ground, or you have to put them higher up and point them down. Um, so make sure they're pointed, uh, they're, they're set at the right height. Um, you wanna obviously point them in a commonly frequented area. Uh, notice the pathways of, if the, of the cats. If the cats always go through a certain part of the fence, you can take a device and point it right at that opening and uh, make sure the batteries are functioning. It, um, if they're not solar powered, uh, then you may need to replace the batteries every now and then and give it time to work. So uh, a lot of cats, the first time they hear this uh, sound from the device, they'll never come back. Other cats are much more stubborn. You know how that is, you know, they can deal with being annoyed and it may take them a week or two before they finally say, you know, I don't wanna deal with this anymore. So. They don't always work on all cats immediately. But when used properly, they're, they're very effective and they're year round. Okay, physical barriers can also be very helpful in deterring cats. Um, you can see car covers. Um, if you're a uh, perfect fence, if you want to fence, you can, uh, they're used to perfect fences designed to keep cats in an area, but you can also use it to keep cats out. It is pretty pricey. Um, but it's an option that's out there. In terms of digging in gardens, uh, you can use the cat scat mat, which is uh, made of plastic. You can see it there and the link to buy it. Uh, you can get these very large rolls fairly inexpensively. So basically what you're doing is you're creating a barrier to digging. Um, the cats don't want to paw at these little plastic spikes. It, it won't um, hurt them, but it will annoy them. Uh, you can also use lattice fencing, put that on the ground and then plant uh, your, your garden, um, put the seeds in the openings and that way the cats can't dig in that area. And also river rocks or any kind of large stones, if they're scattered through a, a garden area or a lawn area, the cats are not going to want to go there to dig. So that's one way to stop cats from eliminating from a certain area is uh, to use these devices. So the question came up about um, alternate, alternative litter boxes, and the answer is yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, keep in mind that cats prefer to, to eliminate where they can bury their waste. So you can give them a nice choice. Uh, options include um, a sandbox like you see here. Uh, it doesn't have to be as fancy. You know, you can just buy a big plastic one if you want and 
kitty sand is pretty cheap. You can um, get a pile of peat moss and put that, and the cats love going in peat moss for some reason. So you can put a pile in the corner of the yard and attract them to go there. You can take a storage bin like the ones we used, uh, talked about with feeding stations and uh, cut an opening and put a litter box inside of it so that they'll go there. And then you just have to make sure that you um, clean them regularly, but locate these things strategically so that they're away from where you don't want the cats to go. So like in this photo, uh, you can see that there's a little garden in the front on the top of the photo. Um, what you could do, you could put some some cat scat mats, a few rocks, uh, just something to make that garden area unattractive for digging, and then take this sandbox, put it way in the corner of the yard, and the cats will be much happier using that. Okay, um, last topic I want to cover are our health hacks, which are just some simple ways to um, keep your cats healthy that aren't costly or difficult or require trips to the veterinarian. Um, and let's get into them. So vitamin C is a great uh, supplement for cats' diets. Uh, not all, you don't want to constantly be giving them vitamin C. Um, you could upset the acidic balance. Uh, but for periods of stress or um, severe weather, like it's very cold out or you're going to trap them and take them to the veterinarian, um, extra vitamin C will boost their immune system. They, they produce vitamin C naturally, but during periods of high stress, they deplete it quickly. So that's why it's really good to supplement it during those times. And you can use a powdered supplement. Have a look at um, The Natural Cat by Anitra Frazier for instructions about what kind and how much. Um, one great thing is uh, organic tomato sauce. It has a lot of vitamin C in it. Uh, just make sure there's no onion because that's toxic to cats. Don't use tomato sauce with onion in it. Make sure you read the ingredients label. But you can, they, they usually love tomato sauce and you can you know, add a little bit to their food. If you're using the powdered kind, you can give up to 250 milligrams um, per cat with each meal. They don't, uh, it doesn't build, up, vitamin C does not build up in them. Uh, when they have excess, they will they'll just um, sec, uh, secrete it, uh, excrete it out. D-monos is a real uh, great thing to know about. Um, it's a cranberry, it's a natural cranberry extract, and it basically helps to uh, eliminate harmful bacteria in uh, cat's urinary tracts. Um, maintenance dose is about eighth of a teaspoon twice a day per cat, and it's especially helpful for cats that are prone to um, feline lower urinary tract disease. So what we'll do is, um, gee, if we see a little blood in the urine of one of our cats or something like that, um, and they're not blocked. Obviously, if they're blocked, if you see a cat is blocked in some way, they have to go to a veterinarian immediately. But if it just looks like a minor infection, we'll give these, uh, we'll give the cats this uh, powder for a couple of days, and it usually clears it up. If it doesn't, again, you need to think about going to a vet. A probiotics is another great thing to um, promote outdoor cats' health. Any cats, actually, and they, pr they promote um, the healthy bacteria in, in the intestines, which makes for a stronger immune system. Um, for cats that are on antibiotics uh, temporarily, it helps to replenish the intestinal bacteria that the medication kills. And you can add it to the food or water about a quarter teaspoon per cat daily. And there's one example, Petdophilus by Jaro, which you can buy um, on Chewy. Okay, let's talk a little bit about fleas. Um, how do you control them naturally? Well, remember our old friend Diatomaceous Earth, which we're using to keep slugs out of the cat food bowl? Well, you can actually use them to kill fleas. It kills on contact. Again, you must get food grade, don't get pool grade. Um, but with the food grade, what you do is you um, pour it into areas where um, fleas would be. So cracks in um, crevices, um, any other place where fleas gather uh, inside winter shelters, you can put them there. 
Again, it's these tiny little sharp to the flea, very sharp things that kill on contact. You can even, if you can handle your cats, you can take some diatomaceous earth and just rub it into their fur and that will kill the adult fleas. Another um, organic way of controlling fleas are beneficial nematodes. So they're like these tiny, tiny worms that eat uh, flea larva and you spray them over the grass in shady areas during a cooler part of the day. And then they start growing and spreading out all over the, the lawn and eat, you know, they're quite voracious flea larva eaters. So that could be a really, if that's a situation that you're in and you've got a lawn, a grassy area, great way to uh, control the fleas. If you want to go with medication, uh, Capstar is a medication you can get over the counter and it kills it. You, you, it, you put it in the food, it's tasteless. Uh, you just have to make sure you give the proper dosage to each cat. You can't just mix it into a big bowl. It has to be one tablet per cat. Um, but it kills all the adult fleas within 30 minutes. It doesn't kill the larva. So, you know, uh, if, if it's a recurring problem, um, you might have to redose. But it's uh, very safe for kittens over two pounds. And keep in mind, uh, Capstar is the uh, original product, but the active ingredient is this Nighton Pyrem. And if you go onto Amazon and you search for generic versions, um, they're, usually, they're usually significantly cheaper than Capstar itself. And they have names like CapGuard or, you know, they just um, rip off the brand. But so uh, those are great if, you're, if you want to immediately, you know, solve the flea problem. Also, sometimes trappers use them before they bring their cats uh, into their holding spaces. They'll uh, the day before the trapping or the, you know, the last time that they're fed before the trapping, they'll, they'll dose them with Capstar to kill all the fleas. Uh, worms, another problem um, cats often get. Uh, now it's normal, uh, keep in mind that for outdoor cats, it's normal to have a certain amount of fleas, a certain amount of worms. They are living outdoors. It's uh, it just becomes a problem when there's too many and starts to interfere with their health. So one way to help get rid of worms is uh, by using garlic. And basically, it um, helps uh, the cat to secrete the uh, worms from their intestines. And uh, garlic is often misunderstood. People think it's like onions are really toxic to cats and people assume garlic is also toxic and it's not, it's not harmful at all. Um, there was a product PetGuard put out for many years called yeast and garlic wafers. We used to, the cats used to love them, so they, none of them ever got sick from it. And um, to, again, if you read Anitra Frazier's book, she talks about how to use garlic and prepare it and things like that. The big question is whether the cats will eat it. You kind of have to hide it in very tasty food if they don't like the flavor. And there's a little sample here about how to, how to prepare it um, a few steps. But if you give that to the cats, you know, once or twice, it should help them um, keep keep their worm, the load of worms in their system down to uh, a minimum. Okay, so that kind of brings us to the end of our presentation. And I just want to mention that our next uh, free webinar with Community Cats podcast will be on uh, November 14th. And we'll be talking about return to field um, and what it is and, and why shelters are using it and actually how do you go about um, implementing a return to field program. So you can sign up for that at Community Cats Podcast. And with that, Stacey, I will hand it over to you. And um, we have a little time for questions if you'd like. Um, and so I will say Susie has been out there answering questions like a wild woman. She's been hmm. doing a great job uh, answering questions. So uh, Susie, I'm going to also ask you if there are any themes that you've seen out there because you've been covering the, um, a lot of the questions. Um, and, um, so I'm looking here, cold weather shelters, um, there's lots of questions about painting, painting, many paints melting on the styrofoam, and is there a specific type of paint to use on the styrofoam? Yeah, you want to use what's called deck paint, D-E-C-K. And uh, that's a really tough outdoor paint that will stick to the styrofoam. And you can get it in uh, multiple colors that 
you can, you know, usually comes in Indian brown, battleship gray, and like a pine green. Are there any there, tips? Whoop, is that Susie? Yeah, hi, hi. Um, yeah, there have just been a number of questions about, um, you talked about a little bit earlier, a bit about relocating cats, but it seems like we have a lot of um, very, very local relocators today, people moving cats from their front yards to their backs. So I've been trying to answer that, but those, but um, it seems like we have a lot of people who are just moving cats just a little bit. Excellent. Okay, so that, yeah, that that process involves, um, but that that's a kind of fun one if you can do it, which is you you have a feeding station, but not too heavy, and then um, you you're feeding the cats in this uh, like a storage bin, and then when you move them, you move the storage bin three feet in the direction you want them to go, and then they get used to eating there, and then you move it five feet, and then you move it four, and you just over the course of a uh, time, it can take a couple of weeks, depending on how far you're trying to move them, you can relocate them from your front yard to your backyard or across the road or whatever it might be. Excellent. Great. Um, can you expand a little bit more with regards to um, tick and flea prevention on community cats? I've had quite a few people also asking about sort of how to handle that with untouchables. Well, again, the thing to keep in mind is that outdoor cats are going to have fleas. So that's not inherently a problem. The problem is if they get infested or you're bringing them indoors for some reason or you, they just look like they're uncomfortable or one of them's allergic. So what you need to do is, is uh, you know, try, try the natural stuff, right, that we talked about, um, you know, try to use the nematodes and the diatomaceous earth to keep the fleas low in the cat's immediate environment, especially where they sleep. If you can fill all the crevices and cracks where they sleep or inside their shelters with diatomaceous earth, then there's gonna be very few fleas in there. And then if they do get overloaded, uh, you can use the cap star or the generic equivalent uh, to kill the fleas. But you're gonna have some, Every animal that lives outdoors every uh, is going to have some parasite load, and that's not an unhealthy thing until it, uh, unless it gets out of balance. So don't try to eliminate all of them, but keep it under control. And I had gotten an email earlier this morning too from a woman um, who said she is she's in Queens, New York, and she bought. 1,500 ladybugs and two pods of praying mantis huh. from a company called Nature's Good Guys. Um, and that um, she released them one evening. Several days later, she noticed there were no no flies, very few mosquitoes. Uh, as for the ants, she found their nest and dumped old cat food right on top of it. For mollusks, mollusk, she put old cat food under leaves and the feeding stations. Usually none of them make um, make problems uh and and they usually drown during during the rain but anyway so she was sending that along with a as a suggestion that kind of start a little insect war there yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. can i barge in with one more yeah go right ahead susie yeah because you've been monitoring this incredible conversation out there go ahead yeah well um you know there have been a couple of questions about very 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 bad neighbors and concerns that neighbors are um, actually poisoning cats so um advice on that front would be great for those people uh yeah it's an unfortunate thing it does happen every now and then um so what we recommend you do is uh, if you go to our website and click on the resources section section and then look at the flyers we have a sample um, also in the back of the TNR handbook. You should download that too. It's one of the handouts. There's a sample, what we call stop poisoning poster. And it's basically a poster that says $2,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of anybody uh, poison for whoever's poisoning cats in this area. And it's a felony and you can go to jail for three years. And here's the police's number to call. And you put it on bright neon pink paper and you plaster the neighborhood with it. And it usually shuts down the activity immediately because uh, first of all, most people don't know it's a crime, let alone a serious crime. And number two, there's not that many people once you kind of get that guilt thing going 
who, who are brazen enough when they know people are watching for them to go out and commit a crime. And it usually stops that activity right away. Also, you want to get, you know, have you had a conversation with the people? Um, is there, some, are the cats all fixed? You know, is there something that's at the root of this problem besides just, sometimes you just have really, really bad people, but usually there's something going on that can be addressed. All right, we have time for one more question here. Um, with the geriatric, actually, there's a lot of interest in the ger geriatric <laughs> question, you know, of how to support um, geriatric cats. Um, and so a lot of questions too about sort of, you know, what, when do you make a decision? So I won't go on to it in too great deal detail, but um, when do you make a decision to decide to trap a cat that, you know, how do you determine when to trap a cat, whether they need assistance or not? Um, and, you know, how have you handled your geriatric cats in your colonies? Well, there's a couple of things you want to look for. Um, I mean, we have had cats in colonies as old as 17, I think is our current um, top cat. Uh, you, you know, you're looking for, uh, like you would with a pet, if, if they're not eating, right, then they need to get to a veterinary. If they've gone a couple of days and they're just, or two, three days and they're not eating and they're noticeably losing weight, that's a sign that they need to get to a veterinarian. If they're limping, if they seem to be in pain and it's not resolving within 24, 48 hours, then they need to get to a veterinarian. So just the same things you would apply to your pet cats. Um, you don't want to rush, and especially with feral cats, you know, in the stress of, and difficulty of trapping them, you don't want to rush them to the vet. But if there's a persistent serious problem around uh, not being able to move and not eating, then they need to see a veterinarian, especially the older ones start to have dental problems. And often it's just a matter of extracting some teeth and then they're fine again. Um, but before they stop eating, they they really have to have gotten to a pretty bad point. So that's a very clear sign. Is there anything that, you, that they can do um, to help their teeth? Sort of anything from a food standpoint? I mean, I know back in the days there was like, certain kind of crunchies that could help. But I, I think the jury might be still out on that. I'm not sure whether those are helpful or not. You know, so much of dental stuff is genetic. Um, so really, and there may be more specific stuff that I don't know about, but in general, uh, the healthier the diet, the, the general health is going to be better and that's going to include the teeth. Um, excellent, excellent. Um, Lucy asked the quick question about how do you trap a specific cat that is injured? And I would recommend folks check out our drop trap webinar. Right, exactly. Yeah, watch the recording of the drop trap webinar. Uh, a drop trap is a trap that you set off manually by pulling a string. And you can wait and you put a big bowl of food under it and you can wait until the cat you need uh, goes over. So if you have an injured cat who's eating, then a drop trap is a very easy way. Uh, to do it. And if you don't have a drop trap, you can use do the same idea. You can use a regular trap and prop the front door on a water bottle with a string around it. And again, put a big bowl of bait in the back. And when your cat that you want goes in, then you pull the string. Just practice it a couple of times before you do it. Excellent. Wonderful. Susie, thank you so much out there in cyberspace. And Kristen, also thank you to you for all your support and your help today. Brian, <laughs> thank you. It's a great, no. it's a pleasure. It's wonderful working with both of you. So thank you to no, the neighborhood cat. And, right. um, and everybody else, thank you for all that you do to help cats in your community, help keep them warm, keep them cool, keep them healthy. Um, whoever's feeding them, four hours, every four hours, they really, they've got it made. Those cats have definitely got it made. I want to come back and search that. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. and Stacy, anybody who didn't get their question answered today, we will get to you in the next few days. Just sit tight and um, thank you for coming. Excellent. Oh, great. Excellent. Thank you so much. And don't forget, November 14th is um, Return to Field, which is right there on the screen. And October 3rd is our Trapper Certification Workshop. And so I hope we'll see you at our upcoming presentations.